Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Federico Talks Watches. Today, it's time for the monthly Q&A, where I answer your questions from my Instagram account. When you see the Q&A picture, ask a question, and that's at Federico Talks Watches. And we're going to talk about everything from Etta versus in-house, the best daily wear dive watch, you know, Blancpain, Rolex, Omega... Um, you know, what would I be doing if not for YouTube and also Zenith El Primero, amongst other things. But of course, before we get started, customary wristwatch check. Today I'm wearing the trusty Seiko SKX, a watch which has gotten very little wrist time in the past three months, even though it used to be my regular rotation. Uh, I've just been enjoying some of my higher end pieces lately. But this one is full of charm, and I had to take it out for a spin. Also, guys, don't forget to check out DelrayWatch.com, a bunch of new watches in stock. Rolex Explorer 1, 36mm, very nice example. A Gerald Genta Retrograde Seconds, very unique. Uh, a bunch of Omegas, Speedy Reduced. We just got in a very cool Vacheron Overseas first generation, which won't be up until tomorrow, I believe, but a bunch of new things are hitting DelrayWatch.com. You should go check them out immediately after you watch this, uh, this video. In the description below is the link. But anyway, guys, in case you see me staring down, I'm just looking at my questions here. Let's get right into it. Claudio Tehran says, would you go back to purchasing watches that have an ETA or Salida based movement after owning in-house developed movements? Curious because I've been feeling dubious in that way after purchasing a Nomos from Delray Watch. Oh, Delray Watch, you bought a watch from us. Thank you so much. Greetings from an old customer. Well, Claudio, um, the simple answer is yes, though less so than before. I have a lot of watches with in-house movements. You know, my Seiko's in-house, my Grand Seiko, my Rolex Hulk, uh, my Omega Speedmaster not quite in-house, my Moser's in-house, uh, my Gerard Perigo. I mean, quite a few. Even though there are some fantastic watches with out of movements that have been dragging me in. I think I will buy a Hamilton Khaki King. I recently, about less than a year ago, bought a Ming, which is one of my favorite watches in my entire collection, and that has a Salida movement, which if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know I like less than ETA. Um, you know, there's the IWC Portuguese Chrono, which is ETA-based, 7750-based. I also want that. Uh, Panerai, big Panerai fan, and I like the Panerais with the ETA movements more than the in-house. So while I am draw drawn more towards in-house stuff lately... I do uh, still think I will buy ETA or Salida-based watches in my future, though not as much as I may have before now that I am predominantly in-house. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not a snob in that way. If the watch is cool, you know, ETA movement, it, it's fine. Aniel Nemni. Aniel Nemni. Sorry if I butchered that. Dear Federico, big fan of your channel. <laughs> Thank you so much. How important is the historical value of a brand to you when considering buying a new watch? Kind regards, Daniel from London. Well, Daniel, it has some kind of importance, though not massively so. Um, obviously, I'm, I love the history of Cartier. I used to work for them. They really brainwashed me. I find it very, very romantic. Uh, the history of Piaget as well. Um, you know, Patek Philippe has a great history. I do want to add one of those to my collection. But I have also bought watches without a ton of history. Like my, uh, my Ming watch, not a ton of history there. Um, even though I'm looking back in my collection, predominantly I have very historical pieces. But, you know, at Habring, I want to buy a Habring. You know, that's a very young brand. I think it plays a small part into it. I think it can make me fall in love with a watch, like a good story can. Um, one of the reasons I love Breguet, for example. But it is not imperative to have a long history uh, to have the watch. If I fall in love with the aesthetics or I fall in love with the movement, I don't need the history. But if I'm on the fence, the history can kind of push it over the top for me. So it's important, but it's not a requirement. 
Axe Gecko says, if not watches, what would be your thing for YouTube? Um, well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I watch a lot of YouTube content, lots of travel content, uh, old school gaming, you know, and personal investment type stuff. I've actually been thinking, you know, when this YouTube channel comes to a close eventually, and I think it will, uh, I've been doing it for, you know, I think four years now. It's not anytime soon, but uh, if I do want to do another YouTube channel, I was thinking of doing kind of like a travel blog, um, you know, going to to strange, you know, not strange, but, you know, more exotic countries, uh, maybe reviewing airlines and hotels and stuff like that. Let me know, would you be interested in that? If, if I made a channel focusing on that, would you guys watch and subscribe? Or, you know, not really your thing? Let me know. I, I'd be interested in that answer, genuinely. Rod PLA. Hey, Fed, if you had to choose between the Rolex Submariner, the Blancpain 50 Fathoms, or the Omega Seamaster as an actual beater, which one would you choose? Love your content. Keep it up. Thank you so much, Rod. Well, uh, let's start. The Blancpain 50 Fathoms. The most luxurious of all of them. Uh, sapphire bezel, the original dive watch, you could say. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Rolex Submariner. Uh, I own a Hulk. Uh, Rolex, it's epitomous. It's iconic. Fantastic. Very, very durable. Omega Seamaster. I've owned uh, the two, three generations ago. I owned that one, the, the Bond Seamaster. I love the new ones. As a real beater, I would say the Blanc Pond is automatically out. I'm not saying it's not a tough watch, but with that sapphire bezel, you know, slightly higher repair bills, and the higher price tag, I wouldn't recommend it as a beater. Uh, the Submariner, lots of people wear it as a beater. Uh, it's still rather expensive. I... Certainly don't wear my Hulk as a beater. I wear it a lot, but not as a beater, even though Rolex is extremely reliable. I think for the price point, um, for the cost of service, which should be about $550 through Omega, and the fact that it has all the modern materials like ceramic, I'd probably go with the Seamaster as a daily beater. It's about half the price of a Submariner, slightly less expensive to repair, still a fantastically comfortable bracelet and watch, very, very high quality. Um, but if I had to pick between those three, I'd say those were my beaters. In reality, my beater is my Seiko SKX, um, you know, and my Panerai 111 just because it's, it's beat to all hell already. Um, you know, I probably wouldn't wear a new Seamaster as a beater, but if I had to pick between those three, absolutely the Omega. Four days out. Four days out, rather. What's your opinion on the look and pricing of the new... Omega Speedmaster Red White. Uh, the look, fantastic. The pricing makes sense. I believe it's $14,000. 321 movement or an updated 321 movement manual wind. Very well finished. Uh, it's trying to compete with the Daytona. Price wise, would I spend 14 grand on it? No. Would I spend 14 grand on a Daytona? Well, yes, only because I could resell it and make like seven Gs, but no, you know, if reselling wasn't an option. Uh, I think it's a fantastic watch. I do think it's a tad expensive, even though for the current market, the pricing makes total sense. I just personally find it expensive. Watches and tech. What are your thoughts on the new Moser Streamliner? Did they get it right? Ah, oh, you guys know I love Moser. They use the ag Agnograph, uh, I don't even know if I pronounce that right, movement that was uh, made by Agnahor, also used in the, in the Singer watch. Fantastic chronograph movement, center minutes, center seconds. Absolutely love it, very intricate. Um, what do I think of the watch itself? God, that designer beat that watch with, with an ugly stick. Um, love Moser to death. You know, I own one, I'm going to support them forever, and maybe it's just not for me, and it isn't just for me, but boy, is that thing fugly. Um, Uncle Rico 1. I've been looking at a Zenith Chronomaster with the power reserve complication, considering trading a speedy bar, broad arrow to help attain it. Question, does the Zenith have more service issues because of the higher beat rate when compared to the Omega 3303 movement? Happy New Year. 
Well, Rico, uh, this is a tough one. Um, so yes, generally Zenith does have slightly shorter service intervals because of the high beat rate movement. I mean, think about it. It beats quicker and more often. Uh, hence, parts tend to wear out a little bit more. However, the Omega 3303 movement in your broad arrow, um, especially if it's the first generation of the 3303, is super notorious for having major problems to the point where I won't even buy it at Delray Watch if, if it's a 3303 first gen movement because it's a service nightmare. That movement never worked, it always broke. So, yes, um, technically shorter service intervals on the Zenith. However, if you have the bad version of the broad arrow movement, I'd say trade it immediately before you get a repair bill. RJMAA11, why did you live in Spain? Do you like Spain? Uh, well, RJ, I, I think I alluded previously that I grew up in Madrid as a child between the ages of 12 and 18. Um, I still have family in Spain. I'm not Spanish, though. I'm, I'm Italian from Napoli. My parents just chose to, to move to Spain uh, when I was a child to try, you know, to, to change it up. Uh, so I do have an affinity for Madrid. Uh, do I like Spain? Absolutely. I love it. I, <laughs> I just spent two weeks there for New Year's, had some of the best time of my life. Uh, my best friends, a lot of my best friends live in Spain. Um, yeah, so yeah, do I like Spain? I, I absolutely love it. <laughs> Last question. Pierce underscore arrow. What watch for you is close but no cigar? I.e., one that ticks almost every box but has a flaw you and you get it overlooked. Um, easy for me, Chopard 1860 with a micro rotor movement. Uh, might be a cop out because the flaw is the size, but this was the absolute perfect watch for me. I love the look, absolutely beautiful, very interesting movement, uh, extremely undervalued and affordable, precious metal, but a 36 millimeter watch with very short lugs, um, and the small crown meant I couldn't wear it. It looked very disproportionate on my wrist, and I couldn't overlook it. Um, maybe one day, when I lose, when I, if I lose the weight, I'd absolutely pick one up. <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching another episode of Federico Talks Watches. Please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. It really does help. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any content. Thank you so much, and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care.